Okay, so I'm gonna just record the um, interview, if you don't mind. Uh, no problem. So yeah, I'm just gonna ask you basically a few sort of diving kind of related questions that to do with the environment. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so can you please start with your name, age, and occupation? Okay, my name is Venkatesh Chardu, and I'm about 59. And I am a scuba diving instructor. In my previous life, I used to be a banker. Uh, but I've been running barracuda diving for the last 28 years in Goa. And also I'm the founder trustee of Coastal Impact, which is a marine conservation, education and research NGO, uh, which started in 2009. Awesome. Okay. And how did you sort of start diving? And how old were you when you started diving? I was, I think, 26 when I started diving. And that was in Hong Kong. That was purely as a recreational diver. But then I got sucked into it and then became a dive master. And then when I decided to come back to India, I became an instructor in 94. Okay. And um, have you been trained in any sort of targeted efforts towards um, coral preservation and restoration? Formally, no. I haven't been formally trained in it, but I've had a lot of uh, marine biologists who have been, uh, if you look at our website, there are quite a few marine biologists who are on it, who are advisors. And also, uh, I believe it's not a rocket science. So, learned on the way. We are not doing the best way, but I think the method we are following is probably one of the most effective ways of uh, transplanting corals because they grow very fast with this particular method. And can you just describe this method a little bit, please? So it's called micro-fragmentation method where we take a big piece of coral and then we cut it into small pieces which are about two to three centimeters. And then we put that on tiles, you know, flooring tiles, Yeah. the reverse of that. Okay. So we put four fragments, one in every corner so that when they grow, then they can merge into one big piece eventually. And uh, it was found by purely by accident in Florida when one of the marine biologists was taking out a piece of coral from an uh, aquarium to outplant it into the ocean. And he broke the coral. The central part of the coral just stayed in the aquarium. So he thought he'll come back and he'll pick it up and pull it out, but he forgot about it. And he went back two weeks later and he was surprised to find that that coral had really grown a lot more than mm-hmm. the bigger fragments. Oh, wow. So that's how he discovered that. Okay. And then decided to play with that a little bit more and then figured out that this was an awesome way of uh, growing the coral. And till date, probably about a million pieces, more than a million pieces of coral have actually been transplanted using this method, which has proved to be very effective. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And are you aware of any drives or campaigns to sort of preserve the coral other than obviously what you're doing? We have started because of COVID now, we are having major problems with funding. Mm -hmm. So we have started approaching companies and also individuals for adopting the coral. So we have got 192 pieces of coral, which we have transplanted. So we have uh, already got 49 fragments adopted. Okay. So uh, it's quite popular. And now there is a company which is interested so I'm, in fact, just finalizing the MOU for them, the Memorandum of Understanding. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. And um, have you noticed a big change in the coral colonies over like the few years, over the past few years? Yeah, there is because uh, there has been a lot of uh, deterioration in the coral because of algal growth, which is taking over the corals and smothering it and killing it. And this is uh, because they're driven by climate change. 
because the water temperatures are increasing a lot underwater. So that is leading to uh, unchecked algal growth. So that is what is creating a problem. That's why we decided to do the transplantation. Okay. And this has been the... happening like for the last three years. Last three it has years. been happening for the last three okay. years only. Before that, it was manageable. Yeah. But it's like increased a lot in the past. A year. lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in the months of uh, April and May. Okay. When it uh, it's peak summer. So mm -hmm. the water temperatures really rise. Thankfully, till now, during the monsoon, the coral has a chance to recover. So bleaching has occurred. But uh, after the monsoons, let's say October, November, the coral all comes back to life. Okay. So okay, yeah. that's but we don't know whether that is going to survive if the bleaching is going to be continuous over a number of years. That is the danger. Yeah. Yeah. And are there sort of frequent breaches in instructions or protocols by tourists who are that sort of threaten the coral, like sort of polluting and stuff like that? No, no, not really because of tourism or because of their impact. Because this is mainly with the waters warming up, which is obviously climate change and global yeah. warming. Yeah. Tourists don't really have that impact because also the garbage being thrown overboard by tourists, it was there earlier. Uh, but that has also reduced a lot because now they're not coming near the areas that we dive, which is around okay. the island. Yeah. They go and to a different place, which is uh, along the shore. Okay. For their picnic. Yeah. yeah. And are there any specific pollutants that threaten marine life or even corals in general? I don't know. I don't think we have done any specific targeted research for this, but obviously the common uh, problems are with the fertilizer runoff, uh, runoff from numbers, which come down with fecal matter and all kinds of pollutants. Uh, because there are a lot of industries and also a lot of uh, homes which are uh, offloading their uh, sewage directly into the rivers and also into the sea. So that, I guess, also plays a role in uh, the pollution. And has this been on the up over the past few years? Actually, it's gone down now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. The waters are actually much clearer. Oh, okay. Earlier, for example, we, you're a diver, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know what, when, I, when I'm talking about visibility, you know what I mean. Yeah. Underwater visibility in Goa used to be around four meters, five meters. Mm -hmm. Now that has increased to seven or eight meters. It's actually oh, doubled. Okay. okay, that's good. Since the last two years, which is uh, during COVID. Okay, so. so there is a positive end, yeah. positive result. <laughs> and has COVID sort of allowed the corals also to grow more? Uh, I don't see any appreciable change in that because I think that is going to take time. Mm -hmm. But because of this uh, other factor of temperature increase, I think it's having a negative impact on the corals. Are there any more efforts that you feel can be made in addition to the ones that are already sort of happening to restore the ecosystem? For sure. So now what we have done is we have proposed setting up of an NPA, which is a marine protected area around the islands of Goa. And we are in talks. We have given a proposal to the Goa State Biodiversity Board. Okay. And we are spearheading heading it through that because obviously that will be a big government project. And we will be involved in that only as far as the underwater work is concerned in terms of monitoring the corals, and also putting forward recommendations to the forestry department and GSBB about which areas should be opened up and on a rotation basis. So we don't want to make it exclusionary for the uh, local stakeholders. We want to make sure that they can still fish and they can still use it for tourism, but in a rotating manner so that we can open up, let's say one area for one season and then we will look at the impact it has had on that. And then maybe close that area off and then recommend opening up another area. So it will be on a rotation basis so that everything has a chance to recover. Got it. Um, okay. 
and what if sort of the government says no no to this then i don't think they will because uh, right now the government is also very very interested in uh, this 3030 thing that is going on you know by 2030 at least 30% of the area around the coast uh, are looking to be preserved and protected okay so a lot of funding has been allocated to this already and whether we do it ourselves or not is a moot point it it will still be done by the forest department and by the uh, state biodiversity boards of the respective states yeah cool those are all my questions uh thank you so much for all your help and your no problem answer. my pleasure